We want to talk about youth unemployment and why it's on the rise in the country. We have two guests who've joined us in the studio. The first one is called Dio Gracious Maguero. He's a technical advisor for youth empowerment and employability at Plan International. And Vince Ayako, who's a resource mobilization and strategic partnerships manager at Global Peace Foundation Kenya. Gentlemen, Karibuni Sana, how we welcome our guests. Listen to the proverb. Yes, our proverbs for the whole of this week are from the country of Namibia. Mm. It is the one who lies by the fire who feels the heat. It is the one who lies by the fire who feels the heat. And your gracious could immediately connect with that proverb. Oh, yes. Why? <laughs> because when you're talking unemployment mm. and youth unemployment specifically, the fire is so close to the young people. Mm -hmm. They are burning up, burning because of uh, literally no sense in their pockets. Mm -hmm. And the world doesn't care because inflation is driving up, going towards, you know, an escalating direction. Mm. So clearly the closest person to add to that level of youth unemployment is the young person we are discussing person. today. Yeah. Uh, that's a good one. Vince? Yes, I can equate it to the saying that goes that is the wearer of the shoes that knows where it pinches most. Mm. So if you look at the statistics, you find uh, young people, majority of them are the ones who are unemployed. So if you look at the labor force that the universities are injecting each year, close to one million people, mm. yeah, only 25% get jobs. Well, 75% of these young people do not get jobs. Okay. Yeah. So first, let's uh, get some figures out there. Um, we get all of figures from all over the places, you know, on the unemployment levels in the country. Mm. What's the latest figure and who's, what's the source of that figure? If you look at uh, <coughs> the World Bank report, mm. uh, especially the one that I was able to mention of the rate of youth unemployment, it has really increased because if you look at the university injection to the labor force each year, it close to a million people. And if it is already one million people, and the jobs that are there are quite limited, only 150,000 jobs were created. So you look at uh, the bit of, when you look at the unemployment rate, you find that the university guys who come out, even mm. the 25% who are get jobs. Are we talking jobs, about universities or on or all, all post? Post-secondary education. Post-secondary education. Okay. Colleges, universities. It accounts to 25% of these people get jobs. Mm. But even the jobs they get, like me, I'm a trained uh, teacher. Mm. But what am I doing now? Resource mobilization. You're a and manager. Strategic. <laughs> I'm not teaching. So yeah. you find even the 25 who do jobs, they do jobs that are not in line with their career goals and objectives. Well, the 75% of these young people are languishing out there Wanajita, the so-called the hustlers, they're trying to look for jobs. What kind of job are we talking about when you say that 75% go unemployed? So for the 25%, we say the decent jobs that we normally talk about, of course, good remuneration, good working environment, the 8 to 5. So the 25%, at least they can be able to have decent job. But the 75%, you find somebody is a graduate and is a tout. Uh, and uh, honestly speaking, with all the due respect, I respect the touts outside there because also that was my first job. Uh, you find that you can, it is not the beauty or the happiness of a parent to take your child to university, you spend almost half a million, and then your child becomes a tout. Okay, I so the 75% then includes <laughs> okay. it's people who have become touts and all yeah. those, we don't count like they're employed. Yeah. That's quite quite a conversation, really. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think we need to just demystify. Thanks to Vincent for yes. giving us figures here uh, around what we would call employment and yeah. underemployment. Okay. And so when we say underemployment, just like we are breaking it down, is I went to study for this specific profession, and I'm still hoping I'm going to get that job. Mm -hmm. But as I wait. And sadly, of course, uh, the public sector is not creating as much jobs for some of these young people to attain. And so I have to do an informal kind of job in the hope that I'll eventually get the job that matches my skills. Mm. So that means even my incomes are lower. More, most of the time, I'm not able to, uh, as a young person, take care of my needs mm. sufficiently enough to start building wealth, start investing, etc. Mm. So somebody remains underemployed. That is also a statistic. But, but let me ask this question. I yeah. really have to ask. Yes. I mean, 
what do you, you, the two of you are teachers like myself mm. yeah. what what do you teach students i mean uh, what do you think all this learning is for why do people go to secondary school post secondary school learning uh, eventually some universities some go beyond some say what do you think all this is really for to get a job so um is it all so that you can get a job no. D- don't you think there's something wrong with that thinking and also yeah. when you think mm-hmm. about the jobs that people look for someone says mm-hmm. they're trained is that not something then wrong with what we teach hmm. absolutely is there not something wrong mm-hmm. with even the courses we provide Correct. how it's yes do they meet the needs that we have because mm-hmm. if you're talking about the time when i for instance graduated mm-hmm. jobs looked for you i had a letter of employment before i even finished my last exam oh, well. I even knew where I was going to work. That is a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's history. Right now that is in the reality. So mm. if we are training people in the way that I was trained, mm. there's something very very wrong. Can Because, I add to that before uh, you ask please. the question? Yes. Because you also talk about those then who are working in, you know, quote on quote careers yes. for which they did not study. Now, is this because they are working in those careers because that is what they could find? or is there the realization that whatever you studied is actually not where your heart was when you were we had the uh, cusps director yes. here mm-hmm. and one of the things she did tell us is that folks are getting into a particular field mm. career field and then they quit or, or into education field and they quit after year one yeah. they quit after the first year mm because For example <laughs> just like you <laughs> because that's actually not what they want to do yeah. now imagine the folks who didn't quit they stay through the four years of university doing something they don't want to do end up in a career that they're not interested in does this contribute to this number mm-hmm. does so, it um, yeah okay absolutely i think um we are now unpacking why we came to this conversation mm. that an empl- fast employment has different pathways appreciating that mm. and education is supposed to prepare our young people to these different pathways mm-hmm. we really have to appreciate uh, that while education has been driven over different a number of decades it's slowly not a guarantee for a job so asking then um, what are we really preparing our young people for it takes us back to two things one close to 40% from a study by McKinsey and company sometime um 2015 16 F- over 40% of employers globally and that could be worse in our region here yeah. feel that the skills that the young people are bringing to the labor market do not meet the market requirements and demand and that is something we have looked on for a long time in different interventions maybe we'll talk about that later in terms of addressing that and that basically means there is quite a significant challenge and problem between the expectations of the labor market and the education system whatever it's preparing and skilling these young people but then on the flip side there's what we call here youth aspirations you know yeah. Yeah. and that is the bit that is bringing a situation where as you say even me when i went to campus i didn't know what i'm going to do mm. and because my parents were teachers and they told me you know we have educated you because we are teachers mm. i had to take a teaching course along the way i realized a number of my talents and i realized teaching is going to just block me in what i want to do mm-hmm. so there is a situation around does also our education system consider youth aspirations aspirations of the young people and learners and consider that most of the time i think no because it's a system that is built on almost predetermined pathway yeah that i have to go to primary i have to go to secondary i have to yes. and then unfortunately this young person discovers themselves and their abilities way after let me not use the word wasting but spending all that time 12 years but you're gracious no. you know here yeah i with your permission can i differ with you absolutely <laughs> thank you so much yes. uh, <laughs> you see as 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 an educator a system is just a system the system doesn't tell you in details and in granular uh, modalities of how to actually teach mm-hmm. or how to get your students to understand what they should do with the knowledge it doesn't so then are we saying we train our teachers wrongly we train our educators wrongly because everything that we're saying in terms of preparation the content of what you're teaching is just a content now h- how to use it that's in the hands of this educator yeah. so are we saying that anyone who purposes to be an educator must then be trained in how to communicate so that what 
the content that they're putting across can actually help this student become this person who thinks differently from the way the teachers think. Because the problem here, as you've said it, it goes back to the teacher. Mm. Mm. Forget the student. The, the, the student learns what they're taught and how they're taught. Mm. Yeah. So, we are saying we have people who are in the education sector who have zero imagination, mm. who don't even seem to understand what is needed, <laughs> and yet here they are teaching, mm. and here they are, we are trusting the lives of our children in their, in their hands. hands. And then there's a disaster waiting for them after four years or eight years. Which they can see. Yes, which they can see. Because they've been through the system. Yes. Yeah, maybe I can just add on that. I mm. think there is a, a mismatch between the, the skills we provide in school vis-a-vis -vis the demand of the labor market. A case study, even me, I did education. Mm. Uh, but I taught for one month. I went to a school. I was teaching from two, from three, from four. They gave me volumes of books to mark over the weekend. And I asked myself, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? And then through apprenticeship, I went to an NGO. And uh, there's, uh, there was an aunt of mine who was working with an organization called Gold Kenya. And I saw how they were analyzing the needs of the people, putting it down, and looking for solutions to solve those problems. It took me six months to learn how to write a proposal, to identify partners, and also to do local resource mobilization. My passion changed because that was what I loved. So the challenge in our education system is going to be addressed. I know other people may differ with me, but I know CBC is going to address that problem. I am happy I was part of a past, uh, uh, organization that was supported see, by... You to address the problem uh, or you try and address the <laughs> Try and address the problem. I Let don't see a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't see a problem. Here is somebody who yes. was, went through university yes. studying education. Mm? Yes. All right? To be a teacher. <laughs> but in only six months time, mm. you are able to reskill yourself into yes. something else. Mm. The education system had prepared you well, my friend. <laughs> it had prepared you well. Yeah. All you needed to do was that apprenticeship mm. for the six months for you to switch. Did you have to go back to school to relearn how to write a proposal? No, no you just sat there and you looked because mm. you could write, you could read, yes. you could and put together your thoughts. Why are you able to put your thoughts together? Because yeah, you had been trained because you've been trained yeah. on how to put your thoughts together. So it doesn't mean that mm. our education system is not really at producing people who are good enough. Look, 500 billion shillings a year is coming into this country from people who studied here and they've gone abroad and they're doing whatever they're doing. Mm. Many of them are not doing what they studied here. If you require yeah. evidence that this system actually works, just look at the remittances. Yes. So, um, mm. very good reflections. Mm. So, just the other day, we were celebrating great places to school and looking yeah. at how education is impacting the society. I think there has been significant, uh, you know, I would say steps in terms of learning how to improve our education system. One of the gaps, I would say, and we have to discuss education, unfortunately, because it's contributing to ultimately want to see an educated person succeeding in their lives. Yeah. If we look at the statistics in terms of how many graduates are even get, getting those jobs, whether overseas or, you know, locally, let's, beyond looking at the money, mm. that statistic is not practical in terms of how many are we churning out against how many are actually going out there to build the economy. That's many, something to reflect on. How many are we churning However, out? Pardon? How many are we churning out? We are churning out close to 800 to 1 million okay. annually yes. through the different university graduates. Yes. University and, and college and tertiary. And sure. So mm -hmm. a professional person. So it's right. basically, yes, post secondary tertiary yeah. education. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what, uh, rather, taking us back to the reflection around um, then is the education meeting the needs of the market? Who is the market? Mm -hmm. Typically, there are two ends to workforce development there's a supply side which is building the skill set the mindsets the attitude and you know linking those skill sets to the aspiration of the young person mm. on the flip side there's the demand side which is then this young person goes on this other side to either grow their businesses and access market or to access employment and so we call it wage to self-employment for as long as they still dotted if no linkage between those two i think what we are working hard and doing very well in kenya is building this person with the skill set they need. But unfortunately, we are not very intentional on linking that to the demands of the market. And that is why you see somebody going through apprenticeship for six months and realizing this is what I wanted. Mm. What if that apprenticeship was part of the interventions within the education system when they were choosing their course? 
when they were choosing subjects in form two going to form three so that it's not about grades anymore and that's why i think i would agree with vincent in saying there's a good direction towards cbc because mm. that is becoming outcome best mm, sure yes. what about so, the involvement though of the overall workplace mm. and you know this uh, goes across board it includes government as a workplace it inclu includes the private sector as a workplace amongst corporates what about the workspace mm. being then involved in education we see it happening around the world yeah. so that essentially that is what partially dictates and in a softer manner not necessarily walking in and saying this is what you must teach but it, it, it informs then the kind of courses for example that one would take or one would be prepared for how can that involvement take root so oh, that you see yeah. education and workplace you know working in congruence with each other Thank you. Thanks. That's quite an exciting question. And I think that's why we are here. Mm -hmm. Both of us and myself, <laughs> to be specific, I don't want to speak for Vincent, mm -hmm. are working in a space where we are contributing and complementing education outcomes by working in the development space, linking labor market, private sector employers to skills development programs. Practical example, just recently, uh, Plan International did launch what we would call inclusive employment for the hospitality sector. And we are saying that young people, regardless of you know their backgrounds in this context, vulnerable backgrounds and different diversities, including youth with employment, can actually, rather youth with disability, can actually have conversations with our guidance to understand both global and regional and national level requirements of the hotel industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we've crafted a program, a skills training program, very intensive, around the specific skill set that these young people need. And these young people are being trained and mm -hmm. supported by the hospitality sector mm -hmm. to get trained, get attached to the hotels, get apprenticeship and grow through a role. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's kind of like a check. And mm -hmm. I say this because... Yeah. Uh, about a year ago, we read an article and we had a discussion about this whereby professional bodies in this country. So yeah. one of the ones, engineering, yeah. you know, career of solutions, had graduates coming out from one of the universities in Kenya mm -hmm. saying that, hold on a minute, there's a particular part that these guys are not trained for. So we cannot actually hire them. Mm -hmm. So the question is, where were you when these fellows went through the five years that it requires you to get an engineering degree at the university informing because they were taught from year one to year five they were taught yeah. coming out wanting to get jobs whether it be electrical whether it be electronic whether it be civil whatever it is and then you're told actually there's this expertise which you do not have meanwhile they've been through training so we cannot hire you so you've got x number of engineers yeah. Yeah. who must either go back to school or choose another path. Or choose another path. Let me add on that. Eh? So uh, to address that particular gap, you find uh, there is hope in the sense that uh, in the mentorship policy that the ministry was able to come up with, with the support from UNICEF, that particular angle you're bringing is going to be addressed in the CBC in this sense. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a pilot project we did as Global Peace Foundation whereby we were getting... Uh, secondary school students being placed in a work environment mm -hmm. and uh, it's called community service learning that's why i'm telling you the guys who are going to be channeled out with the cbc are going to be guys ready for the market in this particular sense mm -hmm. they are placed if it is uh, an organization doing uh, lending they will be placed in the marketing department for four hours to know how do you market that particular product and then another four hours are going to be taken through the accounting department. How do you account? The other uh, initiative is another four hours in the debt collection. How do you know good clients and bad clients? And then the other four hours are going to be placed in the management. How do you able to manage a team? So in this particular sense, before they go to the field, they look at what they are learning in school. If it is business and they're dealing with customer management. So they learn it in class, and then they come to an institution like this. Even the standard media group, you have all these departments. They, they go through across all these departments. So eventually, when this person go back to class, he'll be able to know, yes, I am interested in business, but which sector yep. of business? Mm -hmm. So that's how you'll be able to address our problem. Uh, most of our people, we don't take time 
to invest on research and development because our intentions, our actions should be guided by data. In business, data is already telling you that most of the guys who establish businesses are guys who do not have KCP, 71% mm. of the 15 million guys who are running the SMEs in Kenya. So if we make decisions based on the research that has been done, but I believe most of our institution, I'm shy to say on this, uh, I don't think we invest much on research and development. And if we do research, we don't leave uh, the data. We don't live to the spirit of the data that we Of collect. what you've said. But yeah. then enough of, of the education system. Yes. Because and now we could argue that what we're discussing today, unemployment being on the rise in Kenya, yes. is not for a lack of skills. Mm -hmm. It is for a lack of opportunities. Where are those opportunities where, I mean, you graduate as an engineer, but your passion is in hospitality. You get an opportunity in hospitality and then you... Mm. They tell you, no, 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 you have the passion, but zero skill. You can't even hold a f fork. Wow. Um, <laughs> I think the so. issue is then the opportunities, but let's take a break. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Our guests, Diogresias Maguero from Plan International and Vincent Ayako from Global Peace Foundation Kenya. We are talking about youth unemployment. It's on the rise in the country. Why is it on the rise, gentlemen? Why is it on the rise, Vincent? Yeah, so uh, from my, I'll, I'll be able to address it from uh, a business perspective mm. uh, because I'm passionate about entrepreneurship. So we find when we have uh, graduates either from the TVET sector, college sector, university sector, these are young people with skills that have been trained to be holistic, to think 360. And you find there is a viable opportunity into the entrepreneurship sector but majority of them are not taking advantage of the opportunities that come with entrepreneurship. And this is how data dictates how there is the essence of uh, increased unemployment. So you find with the 15 million guys who are into entrepreneurship, you know how many have got degrees in the SME sector? Mm -hmm. They are 8, 9.8%. This is according to business guide. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? We have guys with diplomas, with certificates, with degrees, still looking for white collar jobs. They already have these skills. But the business guide is already telling you that guys, we have 15 million guys in the SME, medium, smaller, micro enterprise sector mm. that employs between one to 99 people. Only 9.8% have those qualifications. What? University degree? University degrees, college degree, certificate degree. And 71% of these guys mm -hmm. who do not even have KCP, they are the ones running the businesses. Mm -hmm. And that is already telling you that the 71% who do not have these qualifications, 54% of the startups they establish, they collapse mm. in their first year. But do you have data to show yes. what happens when people who have these TVET qualifications or degree start businesses, do they have a higher chance of succeeding? Of course, that's why you find... Is the, there evidence to prove that? There is evidence. If you go to the business guide, 46% mm. of these startups succeed. And most of the businesses that succeed are from the TVET because they're given 90% practical training, 10% mm. theory. So somebody goes to a TVET, learns about hairdressing and beauty, learns about cakes, and he gets outside there, not with an intention of going to look for employment, but, but an intention to start their business because they have been given skills to run that particular business. However, there is a challenge mm. because majority of them also, also why their businesses collapse uh, uh, is because they have been given practical skills, but the bit of business management skills is lacking because those businesses that collapse, the 54%, they collapse because of four reasons. Mm. Number one is limited business knowledge. Mm. Number two is lack of ready market. Number three is lack of market linkage. And number four, which comes last, is limited access to seed capital. Okay. So when now we want to create employment, data is already telling you what you need to do. That 71% of these guys who start up businesses, they do not have those higher qualifications. Okay. Let me ask you something. Huh? Yes. You go to college, you go to a TVET, you are educated, you are yes. trained. Yes. Now, whatever practical...
processes you go through in the institution, they constitute the foundations of your skills. My question is, does one acquire skills in a learning institution or in the workplace? <laughs> to answer your question, uh, the skills what Plan International did with the Global Peace Foundation and our Leap Hubs, it's in the workplace. Because in school, you are fed a lot with theory, theory, theory. The only place where you'll be able to get these practical skills is within. That's why the TVETs, they stand out. Because it's skills, but what they also have a challenge on is the knowledge aspect. Of See, the question well, where I'm leading to, yeah. even when you talk about TVETs or the universities mm -hmm. where it is argued there are a lot of theory is taught, huh? yes. there is a process that once upon a time existed and was practiced, but mm -hmm. somehow we let go of it the apprenticeship system. Yeah. So the success that we speak of in a setup where one is an apprentice is bound to be higher. I don't need statistics mm. to tell me. Yes. Mm. I know it will be higher. Mm. So because your skills are being enhanced by somebody who's already acquired them through practice over a long period of time. Yep. Now, do we have such a system? So, um, <laughs> Currently we don't have. That's what we are trying to put up through the CBC. <laughs> Yes. Even beyond that, yes. there is the socialization. I mean, mm -hmm. um, many of the people who are coming out of, let's even not go into university, just go into the people who are coming out of the vocational training. The first thing that they want to do is when they come to your workplace, they're looking for a job, not with the intention of apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. this, even when you say, okay, I'm going to give you internship, internship to them is probation. Yeah. Yeah. because you're eventually going to absorb me, all right? Mm -hmm. So the whole mindset of the industry and the graduates is not an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. It's not that oh, you're coming here, you'll be here for a year, mm -hmm. you will train, and thereafter, if, should you choose to leave, you will leave, you'll go and start off your own business, but you're here to learn. Yeah. In yeah. fact, the whole thing is, I cannot have spent so much time training you, and then you go, surely. I think... Um I like that there's a bit of significant argument here, <laughs> which is a good start to us a direction. Um, allow me to say this, and the graduates out there who went to typical public spaces would forgive me. Mm. I think we are all, um, and maybe using the 844 system, we have all been pre uh, taken through a system that makes us come out as academic tourists. Mm. And by that, I mean we can tell all stories of how everything works. I'm a mechanic, but I read it through books for mm -hmm. example right and so i can tell how everything works until i'm given the engine and the first time i may be interacting with that engine as a qualified mechanical engineer could actually be at the workplace mm -hmm. four or five years after my education and when you look at this young man who potentially just completed couldn't compl go to high school after class eight they went into a tibet and the first week they were under a vehicle with a very old you know engine even yep. though it's outdated they had experience of it as part of the learning. Mm -hmm. And so I think going forward, it's us to appreciate that ultimately you can either do the job or you can't do the job. And we cannot, I've seen sometimes institutions that are learning coding mm -hmm. programming mm -hmm. on the board. Mm -hmm. Just because maybe it's a university and so it's computer science and that's happening. But when you look at corners of our cities, there are young men and women who have gathered and they're learning coding using laptops. Yeah. And so it goes beyond the certificate then to get the ability. But then just to sum this up, mm. I would break it down in terms of workforce development into three areas. One, technical skills, which is the ability to deliver using, you know, whatever your hand learned. But then it goes beyond that into mindsets and behavioral skills. And so a right mindset with the right technical skill will actually succeed. The right person with the right attitude will succeed the job market. Unfortunately, a lot of our education, which is also, uh, or rather workforce development uh, programming, is hundred or significantly put on uh, technical skills. Mm. But this person is not prepared to realize that apprenticeship mm. is a significant it's process part of the that I have to go through. Mm. And so I come looking for a job and I tell you, I have a graduate in project management, give me a project lead role. How much experience how many jobs how many sorry projects have you led but how do you train how yeah. do you train people to have the right attitude how do you train them uh yeah to actually have this mindset because you go through all this learning process you yeah. have all these units you train people in yeah but how do you inculcate this important ingredient because even at the workplace 
apart from the technical skills, even if someone had them, there's something that many employers complain about. Mm. Attitude. Yeah, correct. 100%. Because it gets in the way of even fundamental things that somebody could easily understand. Mm -hmm. Like when Eric talks about somebody comes in as a, a trainee or somebody comes in as a what's that word again intern intern mm. the whole attitude mm. of this intern is that they are bringing value to this organization yes. and then they're, they're coming to learn mm. and so that attitude gets in the way of so very many things mm. so so maybe to add there i can share my practical example they always say your attitude defines your altitude and uh, when I first entered my first job at PCA Silly Community Center, allow me to mention the name of Ehud Mokuha Gashogo. Mm -hmm. He runs the Ajira Digital Program. So I was fresh, no experience. He called me to his office. The role of the managers there, mm -hmm. you can either kill your workforce or unleash their potential. Mm -hmm. My first boss told me, Vincent here, people have got skills. They have studied up to Harvard. They have gone up to Malawi. But let them not intimidate you. What I want you to have... <laughs> they have gone abroad. They have gone... Up they, have to gone they have studied overseas. <laughs> Malawi and Harvard are both... Abroad. Yes. yes. I've <laughs> given <laughs> Africa. And, uh, <laughs> so, he yeah. said, Vincent, for you to succeed, you must have the right attitude. attitude. Yeah. And he's, he told me, if you don't know, always feel free. Come to you don't need to create an appointment. Come and tell me you don't know. So I'll guide you. So for them to inculcate that positive attitude, I also think it applies to the both, both the intern, the volunteer, and the employees, and also the management. Because if the management has got the open door policy and the ability to unleash the potential, hold the hands of these young people. Mm. Some of them are too young. Some of them, they don't have the experience. Some of them, they don't have the connection. They do not have the exposure. Mm. They just need to have the right leader who will be able to coach them. Of course, being also patient with them. You know, sometimes mm. we, the young people, sometimes we are very, we give up very fast. Mm. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's, 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 it's ex extremely ambitious. Yeah. You said the four things that... Um, uh, are a challenge yes. that leads to businesses collapsing early. Number one was? Number one was limited business knowledge. Limited business knowledge. Yes. And number four was? The least was access to seed capital. That's why we talk even about the hustler fund. Pauline Is it the money Pauline or the knowledge? Reasons. Pauline says <laughs> yes. the limited access to capital is the main hurdle. Continue <laughs> reading that comment. <laughs> <laughs> the, says, the limited <laughs> access to capital is the main hurdle. I went to Kenya Poly. We were taught entrepreneurship. Yes. So we get that starter knowledge. I'm in the baking industry for several years now and it is not easy. I just want to say this. <laughs> um, without attacking the person, yeah. that I believe is a mindset issue. What? The because access to capital? Let me unpack it. Mm. Okay. If my business can only run when I have a million mm. and that means if I have 100k it cannot run mm. there's a problem mm -hmm. I build up from 10 to 15 to 10,000 to 100 to 1 million yeah. if my 1 million is 100 percent so that means 20 percent cannot gracious, take me to 100 my problem is even a thousand shillings yeah <laughs> forget 10,000 20 30 10 I have the idea I'm trained do you have a hundred this yeah, 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 hundred forget how, yeah, yeah no, exactly yeah. But that's my point yes. I mean, she has a big saying watch out the 1000 yeah. do you have, you have 100 you, you have 100 can 100 take you to the 1000 uh, yeah. if if 1000 is 100 percent what can 10 percent okay. of your you brought uh, target okay. so you want to bake a cake and it costs a thousand <laughs> but you have a hundred can you bake a muffin actually the <laughs> thing is, yes Big, to uh, sell. I mean, I don't want to speak like no, something else. Bring, I don't want to speak yeah. like motivational yeah. speakers, yeah. but you might start with a feather <laughs> before you start mean. the whole poultry. <laughs> <laughs> but let's be honest. <laughs> I think um, I think knowledge is critical, yes. and part of knowledge is understanding that my business plan has a growth trajectory. Ah, sure. yes. And if I sit and say my capital X is a hundred percent. And I will either do business with 100% or, or nil. We have seen people fundraising for 20, 15,000. Sometimes we run challenges where we say, what can 15K do for you? Mm. And a young person comes and says, 
I just want to buy ABCD with 5K. Mm. I am yet, I'm not sure what the other 10 can do. Can I get five to start? Mm. Mm. And three months or whatever number of period later, now I think I need the 10K. You know what you say is true, but yeah. also remember that there is something called venture capitalism. You see, mm. it's not just a question of me wanting to have money for my business, mm. but someone who's willing to work with me in that risk, meaning... Mm. 100%. Yes. So, so it's not just the money. The money accompanied by expertise. Mm. So we are actually agreeing with you that the mentorship. purely money is not number one. Yes. No, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. I'm agreeing with that lady. <laughs> the money, just give me advice. <laughs> if you don't have money, what is that? How am I going to yeah, eat no, advice? Eat advice? <laughs> yes. <Okay>. Okay. <laughs> May I say something? Yeah. I, I, I want us to take ourselves See. back to a typical TVET that mm. is teaching business course. <laughs> right. Yeah. What does the trainer do most of the time? The they are probably a teacher. Mm. Mm. They are reading business books and training. That's Have why they run a business? We, that's why recently the edicts that came Min, out yeah. saying, stop mm. all these business courses. Absolutely. If you're joining a TVET, do it for the practical skill. Yeah. Because if, just building up to some of the other gaps, mm. if I am a business trainer and I'm not running a business, what the hell am I doing telling mm. people, <laughs> reading books? Mm. Mm. Let's build apprenticeship and coaching program so i can meet this person who tells me it's okay for you to aspire to have five million yeah. for whatever level of your business but this is the practical journey i've gone through three Started years. the ten thousand. let me show you how so i yeah. think it's that gap of knowledge and the coaching bit uh, yeah. you, you know i'm still I'm, I'm still not agreeing with you here I, i'm going to explain why i'm not agreeing with you you see if you have run a business yes. you will know that even when it is moving forward. Sometimes there are bad patches. It's not that you don't understand business. There are bad yeah. patches and you do need money. It, 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 it is not, you yeah, have the you skill. Need, you need to have liquid. Yes, you do need. Yeah. Cash flow. Yes. B before it can even get to a point where you can even talk of reserves, yeah. that support is utterly necessary. Mm -hmm. But I want to move away from this discussion and now, now I want to discuss something. It's my favorite topic. Okay. Something I'm discussing. Mm -hmm. It's, not just how we train teachers, but the requirements we have for teachers. Mm -hmm. We set the bar low. Mm -hmm. That's true. If we, our requirement for teachers or educators was as high as the only place for doctors mm -hmm. and engineers and all these other courses, architecture and all these high-flung courses, because these people are the ones who end up teaching these fellows, mm -hmm. we would start by having people who have the right attitude towards their job. Not people who feel that you're a teacher because you couldn't get what you wanted so you end up being a teacher, a teacher. yes <laughs> you can tell when you find a teacher who likes their job you tell the students are what indicate that this teacher loves their job they don't mind marking right. yes they don't mind marking <laughs> <laughs> this girl's put off by marking <laughs> now i'm talking to somebody who taught for 19 years <laughs> so i can tell you the marking is an <laughs> issue because the marking is what tells you about the students what you're looking at is the student's communication with you. You've given mm. them an assignment. You look at it, it yeah. tells you about the student. All right. Then let's take it to the level where you're talking about tables or lecturers. Eh? Mm. Problem is that most of these people are not teachers. They have mm. never run a business. They before. need to be trained to teach, first of all. Yeah. Mm. They need to go through uh, these lecturers, these professors, they need to be taught to be teachers. Mm. All these, Many of these professors are untrained teachers. Mm. So the skill of actually communicating that knowledge that they have, they don't have. Mm. This thing that you're talking about, how you mentor a student to get them to the point where they, they don't have. Mm. So we shortchange the people who go into those institutions and come out at the end. Correct. All right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now that's the end of my favorite yeah, let topic. Let me just <laughs> add yes. something there, Latif. Uh -huh. uh, just to support my lady, uh, the comment yeah. from Pauline. The, Pauline. Yeah, Pauline. Yeah, Pauline. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one thing is the guys who teach business they've run for, never run any business they've just crammed books i want to give a practical example i sell chicks like chicken one month old yeah, chicken yeah, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. chicks mm. Mm. So yeah. this one, day old we started chicks. day old chicks, okay. one month old. Oh, one month As old. we sell one, it's called product clarity. Okay. So we started in Kenyeji November, or, uh, improved Kenyeji Kroiler okay. breed. Oh, interesting. So now mm -hmm. we started it in November 2018 and it's sweet to learn on job. Mm. Mm. 
So we, we never had any knowledge. We never knew whether we wanted to start selling mature chicken, mm. selling eggs mm. or meat. So to quote Nanza too, we started with 200. Mm. And then eventually as we were growing, we realized, we did a market survey and we realized these farmers, they get their chicks from very far. And what problem were they facing? Morbidity, yep. mortality rate, mm. eh, f r limited information on feeding, vaccination, yeah. biosecurity. We eventually developed our own authority in that field based on practical skills. So one problem that can be able to be addressed to solve the unemployment bit, I like the bit of investing in research. Do it yourself, learn, improve, fall, wake up and run. Mm. So we came up with a business model canvas with the nine building blocks. And we said, what is our value proposition? It helps you to define product clarity. We said we want to sell one month old improved Kienyeji chicks that is fully vaccinated of the right body size, given proper vaccination. And then we ask ourselves mm. the next question, who is your customer? Not everybody is your customer. With a laser beam, you need to map out who are your customers, the schools, the poultry farmers, the farmer groups, because you're not go selling to everyone. Mm. And then customer relation, how do I get, keep and retain my customer? having a customer pipeline because you need to be targeted. We say business is a science. Channels, how to reach your customers, revenue stream, how you'll make money. And then you come to the partners you'll be able to work in to drive your value proposition, customer relations, and then you come to the bit of the cost structure. If you do business like that, then chances of you being part of the 54% that collapse will be very slim. Actually, you could very well be. You know why? Eh? Mm. Everything you've said is true. That is, if someone wants to study a course of business and how to do business, but there are those who argue that to actually understand business, you need to have a failed business. Yes. If not, several mm -hmm. failed That's businesses. Yes, yes. Then you... Yes. <laughs> you pick yourself up. Or then you realize what this thing is all about. Yeah. You see the... Sell the old chicks. Let them die. Die on you. <laughs> or have those day old chicks grow into full full grown mature chick and then suddenly the people who look up to them tell you these things are just dying mm -hmm. and then when you go you find these guys are getting fatter and fatter and you realize my goodness they are dying <laughs> but not dying. quite but not quite the way these guys are telling <laughs> you you're killing them <laughs> i think you have to appreciate that uh the business world is a whole conversation yeah. and experience is the greatest uh you know teacher, teacher. in business and going further to say that business is a significant pathway towards self-employment mm. it's still very con you know very relevant in this conversation mm. and we may not have done when i say we i'm talking about systems i'm talking about both education and even other you know labor market players and private sector we may not have done enough as at now mm. to support young people in growing their businesses it's sad when you look at statistics as being mentioned here and one of the biggest though not being the very first you know agreeing is how are we preparing our young people to meet the business needs based on their unique selves, aspirations, identities, even gender? Yeah. You know, one of the things I've seen coming up right now is what people are calling gender lens investing. Mm. That we are saying, can we look at businesses that are contributing to benefit, for example, young women and girls? Yeah. They could require a unique value addition or rather you know unique uh, products for that mm -hmm. so access to finance is great but i think we have we have a lot to do around li just like we are linking young people to jobs mm -hmm. creating that linkages between business owners experienced yeah. business owners to support our upcoming businesses, businesses. Mm -hmm. it's sad while it's a reality that somebody has to fail in a business mm -hmm. to to actually succeed but would is it really fair would it have been better if we had people who have failed before us to mm -hmm. actually enable us not fail mm -hmm. and mentor the company. by mentoring, coaching in the different sectors? You know, Your Gracious, there's something called the lecture circuit in yeah. the U.S. Huh? Mm -hmm. Retired presidents and other senior people who've been in government join that lecture circuit and they're paid very well. Mm -hmm. They even get people from all over the globe. You know why? Mm -hmm. They're not coming to talk about theories. Yeah. Yeah. They're talking about, they're coming to talk about what they've done. Mm -hmm. So when this person talks to you, you don't even ask them where they went to school because you know <laughs> this is what they used to do. Yes. Mm. So when they are talking, yeah. they know what now. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a reservoir. Now, I can't, we don't have that, you know. Yeah. We don't. People retire and just disappear into the village. Yeah. Mm. That's true. That's and, why and they don't talk to villagers. <laughs> no, they don't. Gentlemen, we thank you very much for joining us today. It's an interesting conversation, and I think we should uh, continue having them. Yeah. Looking into how then do we open up those opportunities for employment. When you say unemployment is on the rise, we need to think solutions. Yeah. And this is a platform for that. Santi for joining us. Dio Gracious Mugero is a technical advisor, youth empowerment and employability at Plan International. And Vincent Ayako is resource mobilization and strategic partnerships manager at Global Peace Foundation Kenya. Thank you for tuning in to Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room today. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow, the first day of uh, February 2023 okay. and the 14th day of Valentine's. <laughs> 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 Have right. a lovely one. Goodbye. <laughs> Ten a.m.